Okay, thanks everybody. My name is Adrian Maldonado. I work here at National Museum Scotland. I hope you make your way up the road to the museum at some time while you're here. Uh, if not, this is just a, a flavor of some of the research that we've been doing in the medieval section, uh, specifically around the Viking Age collections, that is material culture uh, dating from about the 9th to the 11th century. Uh, it's resulted in a, in, in a recent book and a new uh, AHRC-funded project around the Galloway Hoard, an iconic sort of uh, treasure hoard uh, of this period. There's a lot of prehistorians in the room, so uh, a, a quick uh, run through what the Viking Age means uh, with a map that has Scotland in the middle rather than uh, Scandinavia. Uh, if you know anything about the Vikings, it's swords and axes, it's raids, it's longships. And certainly, if you take the maximalist view, all of the areas colored in red here at some point over the 9th and into the 10th centuries fall under the aegis, the control of uh, um, Scandinavian language speakers to some capacity. But putting a map like this, where it's all unified in a single color, in a single bubble, is of course quite misleading. What you're actually looking at and what the best work in the last few decades has shown is that that area is actually a series of interlocking zones of communication. Jane Kershaw's work on Scandinavian or Viking identities is actually really a close study of links between England and Denmark, for instance, seen through that experience of dress fasteners. The Viking diaspora has been very influential. Uh, Judith Yeish's work, Leslie Abrams' work, that notion of a diaspora is talking about a superstructure but articulated on that sort of interpersonal basis through families, through marriage, uh, through that sort of face-to-face uh, -face connection, which is really what uh, any period is all about. Uh, um, and, and even this concept of decolonizing the Viking Age, something that has become very trendy, but uh, uh, first called for in 2003 uh, by Svanberg, the way that the theory meets the road in this book is by a series of hyper-local studies of what happens in the Viking Age in various parts of the Baltic and southern Scandinavia. I think that's the only way to get into and say something a little bit new and interesting about the Viking Age is to kind of uh, uh, see it as a sort of these interlocking interpersonal relationships and zones of communication, basically experiencing the Viking Age on a very local face-to-face -face kind of way, the same way that anybody would have experienced it at the time. The current project that I'm working on now, which I won't talk about today, is a really good example of this. This is a diagram of the Galloway Hoard that I mentioned, deposited around 900 in southern Scotland, southwest Scotland, which is kind of an interface in between the Irish Sea zone and the sort of Danish and uh, 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 sort of North Sea uh, 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 seaways. It kind of sits between two of these interlocking zones of communication. And you can see how it, it, it sort of is mostly concerned with piles and piles of silver armbands and ingots. This is the typical sort of Viking Age hoard of the time. Lots and lots of silver, hack silver, things being cut up, used as a form of proto-currency. But the more you drill down and the further down into that hoard you go, the less and less Viking it looks and the more and more local, that is Northumbrian at this point. Anglo-Saxon and uh, the grave goods, uh, sorry, the, the objects that are in this lidded vessel that you can see uh, down at the bottom right are actually almost entirely local to this area. A couple of Irish sea things, a lot of Northumbrian Anglo-Saxon brooches, and even the quote-unquote Viking silver, the armbands, are signed, it seems, with runes, not Norse runes, but the local Anglo-Saxon, the old English runes, and they seem to bear English names. This is an example of that Viking Age sort of coming to town and the experience of that locally with this superstructure, the Viking silver that you get everywhere from uh, Gotland to Ireland over the top, but being sort of uh, 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 used in a local way, brought into uh, the local community and sort of being adopted. People locally, I suppose, buying into these wider communication networks. I think that is a much more interesting and much more fruitful way of approaching the Viking Age as a sort of local phenomenon. All politics, after all, are local. Uh, the rest of the paper, I just want to talk about these weird things. 
These are ringed pins, and if you know anything about the Viking Age other than swords and axes, you know that these are kind of the calling card of the Viking Age in Britain and Ireland. Wherever you see one of these, there's been a Viking or you're in the Viking Age, okay? Uh, these are very simple dress fasteners. The thing about them is that they're cheap to make, they're easy, uh, they're rarely made in precious metals, they're not showy, they don't have a lot of room for ornate decoration of any kind. You can actually only tell that you're wearing one when you're very close to somebody. What they actually represent is not the pin itself, but what they are fastening. It's the big shaggy cloak that goes over your shoulders. It is a kind of dress that is used in the Irish sea zone uh, and is uh, adopted uh, because it actually works very well when you're at sea. A big woolly cloak keeps you warm across your shoulders and this becomes the quote-unquote Hiberno-Norse, that hybrid form. Uh, and, and this is an example of how it is worn. It seems to be based on when we find them in graves. It seems to be worn at the shoulder to kind of hold the cloak uh, together. And also it doesn't seem to work very well because you have to tie it off. Uh, examples from Dublin have been excavated with the cord still attached where the ring that is loose is tied to the pin after it is fastening the textile. Okay, it seems cumbersome to us, but I guess if you've never seen shoes with shoelaces, you probably think that was cumbersome too. Over time, this becomes second nature, I'm sure. The thing about these things as well is that they are very personal objects. They are not handed down. They seem to be quote-unquote disposable in a way that really wasn't the case with personal objects before. Brooches in particular are very ornate, a lot of room for decoration, and certainly handed down generationally in a way that ring pins are not. They are also used in male and female graves and also found as stray finds more than these ornate brooches would be. Therefore, they give us a kind of uh, a, a greater coverage of, uh, I guess, uh, 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 more like everyday people, although they are also used by the elites. They are not a Scandinavian form of dress fastener in origin. In fact, they're an Irish uh, object in origin. Its deep origins go back to here. Uh, maybe as late as, as early as the 5th century, but certainly in the pre-Viking early medieval period in Ireland, there is a variety of pins with ring-shaped heads that work in a very similar way. This kind of pin actually emerges independently in lots of different contexts. There are quote-unquote Germanic versions of very similar things. But this one in particular, especially with that spiral, uh, uh, that spiral ring pin, uh, 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 ring, echoes other uh, uh, dress fasteners and uh, dress items like spiral arm rings and spiral finger rings. So it seems kind of uh, diagnostic of this area. And uh, we don't only just find them in, uh, uh, in Ireland, we also find them in the west of Scotland where there are, of course, Irish speakers. They are connected by sea before the Viking Age. So we know that when the Vikings do eventually arrive into the Irish sea zone, uh, it is in Ireland, but also in the west of Scotland where they are encountering people wearing these objects, okay? Very quickly, they become integrated into a new form of dress, and we call that a new name. We give it a new label, a hyphenated label, Hiberno-Norse, because it kind of sits astride those two worlds. It is a sort of uh, ancestrally, I guess, an Irish kind of thing, but again, it fits into this uh, mode of other kinds of dress pins found elsewhere. Uh, it, it, it seems to have, by the shape of the heads, sometimes they're shaped like penannular brooches, and sometimes they're shaped like other things which look back to uh, contemporary and older Irish and insular dress fasteners. They're miniaturized versions of those. And so they are very much communicating that ancestry through their head form, uh, despite it being a quite a simple ring. Vikings uh, are famous for their... Uh, Furnished burials, these are uh, especially boat burials, are very loud statements of that sort of pagan Norse identity, if you like. Uh, and they have been used to say that these are people who are bringing a Scandinavian culture and expressing it loudly in a foreign country, sort of holding on to that homeland. But they are also, again, uh, by the time they appear in places like Scotland and Ireland, these furnished graves are already in uh, 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 using a new form of dress that has been developed in this 
uh, 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 context of wide communication. They're also repurposing other kinds of insular objects, like these fragments of a Christian reliquary that have been taken off of this sacred object and made into brooches for use on the shoulders uh, uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a take on the traditional Scandinavian female dress. Here's another example of how they are incorporated into that traditional style. So the furnished burial practice is something that is certainly introduced to Scotland and Ireland. It is not practiced here before the middle of the ninth century. And so this is a new thing brought by that movement of peoples. But again, it is a mixture of different things as soon as it appears from 850 onwards. They are already in this sort of uh, uh, world where they are adopting uh, new things along, uh, alongside keeping the old things. These are typical Scandinavian style oval brooches, not made anywhere in, in Ireland or Britain, certainly imported from the north. Uh, and these uh, glass beads, which are traded in urban centers like uh, Reba and Hedebu. Uh, lower on the torso, this woman is also wearing two objects, which are of the kind that we call Hiberno Norse, the ring pin, which I've shown you, and these decorated belts. Neither of these have any kind of predecessor in Scandinavian dress. They are adopted and adapted into what is being expressed as the, what we call now, a typical Hiberno Norse, a Viking Age grave. By the time we get Viking Age graves, they are already something new, which uh, is developed in this specific local context. I'll fly through the last bit then. Uh, the last study uh, of these, which included Scotland, was Tom Fanning in the 80s and 90s, and all of his maps of different types of pins have lots of dots in Ireland, lots of dots in Greenland and Scandinavia, and Scotland seemed really kind of sparse. Uh, uh, before that, with the advent of more responsible metal detecting, greater excavation, greater retrieval of these things, we are now we have now doubled what Fanning knew about. And what's interesting about the new distribution that I'm working on now uh, is that there is a lot more that, that uh, beyond the northern and western isles and coasts. There is a lot more of these ring pins in places without any known Scandinavian settlement, with very few, very little evidence of raids. There's just a lot more adoption of these things, but we can get even more granular than that. Uh, a heat map kind of expresses these, uh, the intensity of these things. Of course, on the northern and western isles, you still have their greatest concentrations, but in the eastern zones, you are getting them in greater numbers than perhaps you would expect. And you're getting these interesting little bubbles like this, which used to be the Pictish kingdom, the, the sort of indigenous kingdom of this area that was sort of reduced uh, and, and, and sort of renamed into the kingdom of Alaba uh, after the Viking Age is also adopting this. So we know that these pins are moving not just by sea, but also over land as well and being adopted into non-Scandinavian settled areas, uh, areas where there are links to Ireland, but not necessarily to the Scandinavian homelands. And then another strange thing happens with these ring pins. Before long, they begin not just to be imported back to Scandinavia, showing that evidence of back migration that we've heard so much about, this sort of counter migration or return migration, uh, but they also begin to make their own versions of these with uh, a, a sort of um, uh, uh, ad adaptations which incorporate local Scandinavian styles of ornament, uh, stamped ornament on silver that you can see in this one from Norway here in the middle. And they have this distinctive form that sort of keeps that ring pin uh, movable ring head, but sort of adapts them to a local style. And even more interestingly, these begin to filter back to Ireland and Britain. It's like bringing coals to Newcastle, you know, uh, uh, cheese to France. Uh, and they're bringing these things back and they're kind of uh, part of the circulation of the insular types of ring pins throughout the 10th century. It is, again, another example of how it's not just migration and then back migration. What you're actually talking about is the North Sea Zone and the Irish Sea Zone opening up lines of communication that are thereafter open and continuing to sort of bounce uh, in trajectories that are unpredictable, more like an echo chamber than anything else. Okay, the other last thing about these pins is that they evolve over time with a very well-studied typology, thanks to the work of Tom Fanning and others, so they can be used as index fossils. And if you track them over time, you get some very interesting patterns. In the 10th century, 
the hundred years or so after the initial Viking raids, they reach their peak, the polyhedral headed type expands out to the newly colonized North Atlantic. And when there is a scatter of finds from North America, one of these finds is one of these pins. That's how ubiquitous they are. But after that moment, in the 11th and 12th centuries, they only continue to develop in Ireland and the Western Isles, and now increasingly in that little weird dot in the northeast of Scotland, where there are links to Ireland, but less so to Scandinavia. This goes from being this Hiberno-Norse thing to being something which is almost a skeuomorph of a ring pin, completely non-functional at this point, but calling back to the shape of the ancient ring uh, on the head, but in ways that are only being, that are only being adopted quite locally, in very short and very localized regional distributions. What's interesting is that the Northern Isles, which at this point are putting up rune stones, they are writing saga literature, they are expressing their links to Norway and Sweden and the Scandinavian homelands in this very loud way, they are still archaeologically dressing uh, in fashions that are recognizable from that Irish sea zone. They are keeping those lines of communication open. And this is the most fascinating thing. A, of the ring pins that are showing up in that northeastern Scottish zone, the former Pictish heartland, it is these 11th and 12th century types. Are these now Hiberno-Norse, or can we call them something else? Is this the archaeology of Gaeldom, the links between Irish-speaking people, now calling back only ancestrally to that old Viking Age form, but now completely localized and made into something new? Are these, do these have anything to do with the Viking Age? Is it just about links between Gaelic-speaking people? So, after migration, beyond Viking exceptionalism, can we tell the story of the Viking Age as shared experience and lines of communication, wider flows of people and objects with unexpected trajectories through them, okay? Copper alloy serially produced pins allow us to kind of get in under that luxury good level of exchange of silver, of slaves, of glass beads, and give us something more like the middle classes, I suppose, a greater reach across the landscape. And the point here is that it's not even uh, ironically about the pin at all, but about a new form of dress, a new form of fashion developed in this a uh, zone of communication, a new form of soft power, perhaps, in an age of expanded horizons. Read more, go to the museum bookshop. Uh, thank you very much.